Hello, and welcome to Marathon Swim Stories, where we connect with marathon swimmers around the world to find out how they got started, what makes them tick, and why they keep going. It's where we explore the human side of the superhuman feats of endurance swimmers, the connections that we have with each other, our support crew, and the waters we cross. If you've ever stood at the edge of a body of water and wondered what it would be like to swim to the other side, you're in good company. I'm Shannon Keegan, marathon swimmer, water relationship coach, and founder of Intrepid Water, where I virtually teach swimming freedom. Freedom to get started, shed the confines of the pool, or your preconceived notions of what's possible. Find out more at intrepidwater.com. Have you ever bitten off more than you can chew? And then the self-doubt creeps in. In your heart of hearts, you want to do the thing, but you don't feel like you're good enough, qualified, capable. I think we can all identify with Nadine Bennett's story. Hailing from the Northumberland Strait in Canada, Nadine is an avid ice swimmer who loves marathons too. At home in the water, Her journey has taken her on quite a ride. Among other things, in this episode, we talk about the inadequacy, overwhelm, and contradictory messages laced in YouTube videos about how to swim faster and better, making the investment in guidance to help you reach your full potential, and learning to swim pain-free through the swim mastery technique. I hope you enjoy Nadine's story. I'm here today with Nadine Bennett. We've been trying to make this happen for the longest time. (laughs) Tell me, (laughs) Nadine, (laughs) what's your swim story? Um, (laughs) Let's see, let's go way back. So my swim story goes back to, um, to when I was a kid. I've been really, really lucky, I think, in my life that my parents always had us around water as kids, whether it was, you know, going to an aquatic park or going to a lake or filling up a kiddie pool in the backyard with water. Like we were water babies and we always played in water and loved water and learned to swim as kids. We were really lucky that that's something that my parents valued. And so as I grew a little bit older, I joined um, an age group swim team. I think I was in it for about three or four years, you know, and, and I loved it. I loved it, but you know, I was never going to be an Olympic hopeful. (laughs) I think you realize that at a point as a kid that you love this thing, but I was never super, super fast. I kind of got up to a point. I was really good at longer distances and butterfly and open water swimming was not a thing back then. So, you know, the cap on distance was a 1500 and, and even then they didn't let you compete that, you know, at a point. So at a point, I kind of realized that I was done. I was also just super tired, you know, training twice a day and, didn't see myself going anywhere. And my favorite swim coach left and I was heartbroken. And so I just sort of stopped and I stopped for 19 or 20 years. And I mean, I stopped cold. I think I could count on one hand the number of times I went to a lane swim. I didn't want to see water. I didn't want to touch water. It just wasn't a good exit from the sport for me in the sense that I just felt like, you know, I I missed it and I loved it, but it just wasn't for me. I was also super awkward and shy, and that's really hard when you're young. And anyway, so all to say, I kind of came back to it as an adult and in a really roundabout way. So I I came back to it as an adult who was really unfit, very overweight, feeling really bad about myself. And so I signed up for the local gym and they had these cardio machines sort of overlooking the pool. And I would watch the adult swim club go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And at a point I was like, oh, it's too bad that I can't do that anymore. And then it's kind of turned into, wait a minute, why can't I go do that anymore? So I started going to lane swims to see if I could still do it before I was willing to join the adult club um, to see if I still could actually swim 25 meters. And I eventually joined and met um, a whole group of wonderful people. And from there, it just kind of blossomed into joining a proper, you know, large triathlon club uh, with a heavy swim base. Um, And I swam with that for a couple of years before someone convinced me to do a two kilometer open water swim. And I remember being absolutely terrified. And I think I swam the whole thing with my eyes closed. I only opened them to see where we were going. 
And I got out at the end and the, the race director who ended up becoming my coach later grabbed me by the shoulder, said, you're good, you're fast. I'm like, no, I'm scared. <laughs> I just wanted to get out of there. Um, but I really loved it and it was exciting and it was, um, it just felt amazing to be in the water and kind of thrilling in a way because there was fish and there was weeds and there was all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and it was really How did you see cool. that with your eyes closed? <laughs> yeah. Down and I'd be like, oh, what is that? I don't know. And I'd just keep going. <laughs> It was um it was really kind of fun. Um anyway, it was just terrifying when you're not used to it. That was really my first open water thing that I did was two kilometers. Um, but I was kind of hooked. I mean, that's all it really took. What do you think it was that so you're terrified of both of the open water as well as nervous going in? How could that possibly hook us as crazy humans who <laughs> kind of fall <laughs> into this stuff, right? I wonder what it is. Oh, um, I think there's something about the excitement of it. And you get out and you realize, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> Bad yeah. yeah, It seems scary and it seemed exciting. And there's all these people and I don't know what's going to happen. And then you get out and you're like, oh, that was really fun. But I did that, right? You know, like it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I think I come up with these questions sometimes and they're like, I interject them in people's stories. But it's, I just feel it's like bigger, the bigger questions about why as humans we do this. Because I feel like you know, as a coach, I'm trying to like, how do you, you know, lure people in and sometimes they're yeah, not totally. ready and, you know, but it, I think I just kind of curious about like kind of what, what draws us in. I mean, I mean, it was a very similar story for me as the, yeah. <laughs> the terrified, but, but then I was hooked, you know? So it, oh, yeah, um, totally. I think it's, and I think that, that I've heard that, you know, from other marathon swim stories, but it's just kind of interesting how something that can be terrifying can end up actually just being, I guess maybe that's just exactly it. <laughs> is that, is that, what initially terrifies you can also become such this place of joy and happiness. And, you know, so let's keep going in here where it took you. Well, and it's kind of interesting because when I was a kid, like when you're in an age group club, you're all about the pool. And I was shy and awkward. And, you know, I, I was never much of a strong sprinter. It wasn't really going to go anywhere. And so that, you know, I had a very low self-confidence about all of these things as a kid. But when you come back to swimming as an adult and you're kind of like, well, this is new and this is different. And, and, um, and I just did that and I don't really care how I place because I just did that. And I think it's completely different than, than what I had experienced as a kid. So for that first thing to be something kind of exciting and fun and terrifying and to be able to do that, I stepped out of that and it just, yeah, it was not the same swimming experience as what I'd felt when I was a kid at all. So that was kind of like, I think as an adult, you come back to it differently too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so two kilometer open water swim. <laughs> hooked. She started hooked. it all. Yeah. <laughs> I did a few smaller local events, but it just never felt like enough. Um, I did some three K stuff that was happening where I was living, and and it just never felt like it was enough. I felt like I barely got warmed up by the time the swims were over, and I just felt like there was more out there. So I signed up for a ten K. Straight from the two K. Oh, you said just some three Ks. I jumped up pretty quickly. I, I think it was just a couple of years later and I had to train all year long for this 10K because I had no idea if I could do it. And I was going to the pool pretty often and it was an organized sort of master's event. So it was a little bit more maybe rigid than an open water adventure sort of swim. Uh, but I ended up setting a provincial record. I didn't know for a year and a half because, you know, you leave one of these things tired and you're like, I'll take my participant medal. Thank you very much. And you, and you leave. And it turns out I, I set a provincial age group record. Nice. I just loved it. I mean, I felt like um, I was flying the whole time and it was just so much fun at, at the 10K. But then, of course, on the way home, I was like, I don't think that's enough. <laughs> I think there's more. There's more there. I wonder what's out there. And so I kind of pondered that for a bit. And that's how I bumped into the Vermont, Vermont gang. A friend of mine told me about swims that were being organized in Vermont and, and different distances. And it was a really good open water community and, you know, kind of fell in with that crowd, fell in with the bad crowd and never kind of came back. But I, I did sign up for my very first swim, a bigger open water swim with lots of people. And it was really super scary. And I was, I injured myself heading into it. So my husband said, why don't you just go and do the mile? Just go and show up and do a mile. At least you'll know if it's for you. Well, every summer since I've been back, so um, from there, it's just evolved into longer stuff and just a joy, a real joy for being back in the water. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you said you injured yourself. And so you just did the one mile. And then that what was what year was that? The Kingdom Swim? Ooh, that would have been 2014. So, yeah, it was a long time ago when you think about it. Yeah. Started with a mile and moved up. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you'd already done a 10K, but that was just the injury that took you down to the mile. Yeah, and I think the confidence, I mean, I think I was happy about the 10K. I was thrilled about it, but I still didn't really quite have that self-confidence to go into something and be like, I can do this. I can do another 10K. You know, it was abs- I was still absolutely terrified of the idea that I wouldn't be able to finish or that I, I would get hurt or, you know, something like that. So I was still very much still had a lot of those feelings and those fears from when I was a kid, I think. Yeah. So going in and doing the the one mile was very low risk as well. <laughs> you know, it's a mile as opposed to the, I think, 10 or 16 that I had signed up for. And um, yeah, so it kind of started there though. Yeah. And you said you've been every year ever since? To Pretty Kingston, much. Except yeah. for the pandemic year when nobody could go? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I try to find something that I can go down to do. It's it's become my happy place. Great community of people, swimmers, paddlers, and Phil, of course, Phil White, uh, the race director. But it's where I've learned to sort of blossom into a different swimmer and try different things and some successful, some not. And so, yeah, every year I try to go back and do at least something there. And uh, where did you go after the one mile swim? I massed Whippy. Yeah, that was um, a 14 kilometer. So again, the longest from one thing mile ever. to 14 yeah, kilometers, I obviously. Um, I was like, well, what's the worst that happens, right? right? So that's where I met Gary Golden, who was kayaking for me at the time. And uh, Massive Whippy was on the Canadian side. So it's the only swim that they organize on the Canadian side, but it's in Quebec and it's it's just a beautiful lake and a beautiful area. So I did that swim and I just absolutely loved it. Uh, We left when it was still a little bit dark in the morning. And so I got to kind of experience that. And I felt fantastic the whole swim. It was pretty choppy. And I remember just absolutely loving it. Yeah, it was just such a fantastic swim. So from there, I kind of knew that it still wasn't (laughs) enough. It still wasn't enough, uh, but that I was capable of doing more. So I started to build a little bit more of that confidence. And started looking at what else they organized and what else they had going on in Vermont. So, yeah. Tell me how you go from nervous and unsure. It sounded like you kind of went from the one mile, like low in, you know. Low risk. Yeah, low risk. Yeah. Yeah. But then you went to the 14 kilometer. What's the worst that can happen? Like there had to be some kind of big growth happening over that year. I don't really know. I think I just have this habit of biting off more than what I think I can chew. And the reality is I did really well. I just didn't really know it when I signed up for it that I was going to be able to do that. So I think I do have a habit of sort of reaching high and not and just wanting to do more. It's just the confidence has held me back, I think, a lot. So um, I, at that point for 14 kilometers, was really relying on my physical training. I hadn't really given much thought at that point to you know, mindset and what it would take, but I really wanted to go do it. And so I really worked hard in the pool. And so that kind of got me to the 14K. Yeah. Yeah. It was really more about just how many, how many kilometers do I need to do per week? And how do I build up the season? And how do I get to 14 without getting injured? And so that's kind of where my head was at at the point, because that's all I really knew at the time. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very well understood (laughs) or well accepted, we'll say. Yeah philosophy (laughs) out there, um, whether Mm -hmm. that needs to be how it is or not. So you're relying on your physical training and that, and that was giving you the confidence that you needed to kind of do that kind of big swim. So then you get, you finished muscle whippy. You said it was a little bit rough. So you kind of probably learning a little bit more about your body and different conditions, but that was exciting for you. I know that's still a happy place for you is when you get a little pushback from the lake (laughs) and you're still wondering what yeah, <laughs> what you could do now. So what happens after the 14K? I think that's when I signed up for Border Buster. So Border Buster is a 25 kilometer swim on Metro Magog. And it's as a Canadian, it's kind of awesome because you get to swim up from the US, cross the Canadian border and come on back down into the US. And so it's like you're going home for a little bit and then coming right back down. So the crossing the border is just like my most joyful moment. And it's just, it's kind of goofy, but yeah, I just absolutely love that swim. So I did that did fairly well again it was a leap it's another several kilometers more yeah it's another it's basically another 10k more from what i was doing and what i had been training on and i didn't do more than 14 going into it so i was really just crossing my fingers and hoping that my training and my just will to finish it would get me through it was really hard i mean my arms got really sore my technique was awful I was like swimming like a crab at one point because I just couldn't get my arms out of the water, but I wasn't getting out for anything. 
So in the end, it, it was a really good experience, but I kind of realized I'm a super novice at this. I need to spend a bit more time learning how these things work. My technique was still all over the place and um, I succeeded, but it wasn't, you know, some sort of glory moment for me. It was just more like, this is really awesome. It's really fun. I need to get a little bit better at this. Yeah. How common do you think shoulder injury is in masters and college swimmers? It's a jaw-dropping statistic that you'll learn in the new Minimizing Risk of Shoulder Injury in Freestyle Swimmers course from Swim Mastery. This 60-minute online course is packed with useful information about why shoulder injury is so common in swimming, as well as practical tips to put into practice right away. Go to swimmastery.online and navigate to the shop in the resources menu or email me shannon at intrepidwater.com and I'll send you a direct link so that you can start swimming pain-free today. So where did you where did you go for resources to learn more? I did what so many of us do. Um, I went to YouTube Mm -hmm. and I went to the internet and I tried to uh, work I worked with a coach as well locally but it was hard to find someone who really understood marathon swimming as opposed to sort of pool swimming or speed swimming and, and really trying to learn how to be super fast in the water. And that kind of mindset just wasn't really doing much for me. So I was trying to learn on my own. And I, I mean, I'm sure I improved a little bit, but it really wasn't going to take me very far. And what I realized over the course of you know moving up into 25 kilometers is I had Um, Not only shoulder pain after swims, but I was having lower back issues. And after that 25, I went back, I think the next year, and I went back to Massawippi and I was trying to do a double and uh, ended up not finishing that swim. Um, So there was obviously something seriously wrong with my posture and my body and my lower back was just constantly sore. So yeah, it kind of, it didn't really do much for me. And I think, I think after that swim is when I met you. Um, And we started working on swim mastery related stuff. And, you know, being a stubborn student, it took a while for some of it to stick, but it has very much transformed my swim into what I'm doing today. So yeah, it's, it's hard to be on your own and not have the right resource who understands the longer swims or who understands that, you know, it's may not be all about, you know, powering through to the finish or things like that. So it's, yeah, it's been kind of an interesting few years. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because there's this this balance that we have to strike because there's I mean, there is that you said that you weren't getting out for anything like in that 25K, but then you got out shoulders hurt, low back hurts. It's interesting that like that attitude, like the realization of like you love this so much, you want to be there so much that you're not going to get out for anything, you know, but like then physically, what could I do to prepare? So you go back, you work a little on your own. You said a little bit locally, you know, you ended up coming to me for coaching. And we still work together today, (laughs) which is awesome. (laughs) But I'm curious, how do we know that when the will isn't gonna enough that, and like, why didn't you just like start training more? Like, why didn't you swim 25K going into your 25K? (laughs) Well, actually it was a couple things. So before I even knew who you were and knew that swim mastery was a completely different way of looking at swimming, I came across a video of Jamie Monaghan swimming in Memphis Magog in the same lake that I eventually wanted to do do the crossing of. And I just remember watching her swim and she was so calm and her arms were just moving very gently and she was just like gliding through the water. And I use that video when I would um, coach other people or show other people kind of that there's a different way to swim. And it just, but it just made me realize that to go longer I was going to need to maybe think about it completely differently. And that was sort of the start of understanding that maybe there's a different way to swim. And then sort of from there, I just realized, you know, that nothing I was doing was really going to safely carry me into much longer distances. I wanted to do more and more, but I just, I could just tell I was getting shoulder pain. I was, I had a winged shoulder blade at one point because it was so overbuilt on one side and that it really just wasn't about training more. My efficiency wasn't there. My back pain was was possibly going to take me out of swimming altogether. That's how bad it was. And so we just had to try something completely different. So I think when I um, came across the swim mastery style and started sort of looking at how that was different, it took a while for me to figure it out, but I'm a very visual learner. And so for me, if you're someone who says, well, all you need to do is go do these drills in the pool and that will improve what you're doing, 
I have a really hard time with that. I can't absorb the drill. I can't really understand the difference unless I can feel it. And what I really have enjoyed about the swim mastery, where it's a lot of visual cues for getting yourself into different positions, is that I, being a visual person, being someone who learns that way, I can absorb that um, a lot more easily and actually feel the changes in the water. And once I started to realize that I was actually moving in really dangerous ways, I'm surprised nothing got torn, you know? And so I think that kind of was a catalyst for sort of stepping back completely and going, okay, I accept that maybe working on my own is not working. I really want to go further and I just need some help. So yeah, it kind of started from there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big, I mean, I went through this myself before I got my own coach is like, it's an investment, (laughs) but when it's something that we love so much and we really want to see, I guess I'm coming to my why now is like, what is, I mean, it's always kind of what are you, my little line of like, you know, find out what you're capable of in the water, but it's like, I really want to know my, like, what's my full potential? (laughs) And I don't think I could just figure that out on my own. I have to have some guidance, but it, it is just, it's just interesting to me how, because it is a financial investment, but if it's a financial investment in discovering your potential, that seems worthy. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when I look at all of the other things I could be doing, this is what I want to be doing and I want to keep doing it safely and I want to go further and further. So for me, it's, it's an investment that's absolutely worth it. Yeah. Um, completely. Um, it's completely changed my swimming. And I just think having somebody guide you along is really important too. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The overwhelm comes up for me a lot too. It's like when you're just scrolling the YouTube videos online, there's millions of them and they'll promises to make you faster and do this and do that. (laughs) But it's then like, uh, and so you do it and then, Am I faster yet? You know, am I faster yet? <laughs> it's like that, like having a methodical approach, I think, to trying anything out. I guess we kind of need to be little scientists in our in our in assessing our progress, but it's just like just the amount of information out there that can be contradictory at times. Oh, um, yeah. It's Absolutely. it's interesting to try to figure out where to go. Very little of it is really about body awareness, I think. Um, and I think that drills try to get you there, but if you can't figure that out or if the drill is just putting you in in a lot of cases drills are putting you into positions you'd never be in when you're swimming and so if you would never be in that position it's like kicking with a kickboard I I love getting rid of the kickboard because you would never be positioned that way when you're actually kicking um so for me that's kind of what changed it a bit it wasn't about learning a particular drill it was about body awareness what what is my body doing when I'm moving this way And if that starts to hurt, then maybe I'm not quite in the right position. And I've been very lucky. Um, I've been able to get video taken either through some of the club swimming I do locally here. I have a tether pool in my garage. Um, I've brought you into the pool with me before. (laughs) Um, And so, like, I think video doesn't lie. And as soon as you sort of see yourself moving, you're like, yeah, okay, I understand why my back hurts. I understand why my shoulder hurts. Look at how I rotate on one side differently than the other. My head is way out of the water. And here you think you're so smooth and fantastic until you see it. You're like, oh yeah. Okay. Now I know what she's talking about. (laughs) Yeah, There it is. So I think like, I've been really fortunate to be able to to do that and highly recommend it to anybody who's trying to sort of figure out how to go further pain-free and to definitely get some help and to try to get video of yourself swimming because it just makes a world of difference when you see it yourself. And so then you can kind of absorb it and you can kind of say like, you be more aware of what you're actually doing. So now when I move in the water, I can tell when I'm off yeah. and could correct. And I could never do that before. Not with, you know, 10 steps to better freestyle or do these four drills. And I just could never really, they would, they would never stick, you know, or I could not really understand what the change was. So it's, um, I think the body awareness piece for me is a really big deal because I think that largely carried me through the longer swims. Yeah. The, the getting video is so important. It's so interesting to me how many people are really resistant to it for whatever I mean, there's a self-consciousness piece to it. There is. And, <laughs> you know, you have to kind of get over it. Yeah. And then there's the, right. And then there's the like, oh, well, my swimming's fine. I, like just, I don't know if it's a lack of desire to improve or I don't know, but it, it's interesting to me it's how resistant people can be to video where, like you said, the video doesn't lie. So it's like, it doesn't know, lie. Yourself, yeah. I, even like you said, you can self-diagnose to, to an extent. So it's like just yeah, just seeing yourself swim is um totally. is uh, yeah. highly highly recommended. So how did we get to these longer swims? What happened after your double masa <laughs> whippy that you got out of? Or do you want to take us to ma- take us to masa whippy before we go? Yeah, let's go, go to the there because that was that was a catalyst for a lot of things. Like 
I was supposed to do a double. So that would have been 30, 29 or 30 kilometers. And I made it to one end of the lake and turned around. And so two thirds to the swim, my back was really sore and um, I messed up my feet a little bit. I did the classic, let's try something different. I'm sure it'll be fine. But really all it took was an excuse for me to talk myself out of that water. I still didn't have the confidence to know that I could do it. I didn't really have the technique yet to get me there either. That's why I was having so much pain. Hadn't really figured out my feeds. I'd gone in without barely training. And so I went back to the hotel. I had a good little cry for a while. I was like, you're not taking this seriously. You know, if you want to do this and you want to love it, you also have to put the work in and you have to do it now. Um, And whether that's figuring out what's going on with your back or, you know, getting those feeds nailed down so that we're not having issues or just not talking yourself out of things. And I think it really pulled me back to being a kid and just not having that, you know, self-confidence or that drive, you know, and I was never going to be a competitive, super competitive pool swimmer, but I had literally none of that confidence to carry into open water swimming. So I talked myself out of that water in a matter of minutes. And I remember Gary sort of saying, are you sure? And I'm like, yep, no, I'm done. Um, And I didn't even really try to finish. And it really wasn't much further. I could have done it. Mm. But it just, all it took was one little thing. You know, I knew I couldn't finish. This was going to be too hard. That's, you know, and then I was out of the water within that, you know, and it just sucked. It sucked being on the boat, going all the way back. Other swimmers would stop and ask if I was okay. And I was like, yeah, I'm I'm fine. I'm just not going to finish the swim. Um, And so that all really like, for me, I, I came back a couple of days later back home and I was like, okay, something has to change. And at that point I started sort of asking around, you know, what sort of coaching I went to see a specialist about my back and this and that. And that's how we eventually met was, you know, needed to make a change and needed to start taking it more seriously. So, so that was a pretty big letdown, but at the same time, that's probably my best swim ever. From experience. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot. I learned that, you know, more had to change than just even the technique and the feed, I had to start thinking about what I was doing too. I'm curious when you went to a back specialist and, you know, and, and it's, I guess I find it, it this interesting thing to relay to any medical, anybody about, well, by the way, so I was swimming for 13 hours the <laughs> other day. And, <laughs> what? <laughs> so I'm curious if what kind of guidance they had for you when you went to this back. Well, it didn't really go that well. So we did a full battery of x-rays and he said, you know, you you have the typical joint deterioration that an adult has. And he said, you know, I mean, if you can't swim 10K, like what's the big deal really? And I was like, no, look, <laughs> no, it is a big deal. This is, what, this is what I love. This is what keeps me sane. This is what keeps me focused. It keeps me happy. It keeps me, um, I'm just a better person. And, you know, and he's like, okay, okay, no, I, I, I hear you. Um, And so we, you know, came to the realization that there really wasn't anything medically that they could do. It wasn't so serious that I was going to start getting injections or anything crazy like that. It was just that um, the discs would rub together and then the nerves would start firing up, but the pain was so intense. Mm -hmm. And so obviously it's stability issues. And he said, you know, maybe you should work on your core strength. There's obviously something wrong with your body position Mm -hmm. because we can't fix it any other way. And so that's where I became super interested and super dedicated to sort of looking at what it was about my body position that was off. And I, again, went back to the internet, tried to figure it out myself. That did not work. Um, and that, but that's when we happened to meet and so started talking about these issues. So yeah, um, the poor back specialist got a talking to that day, but he was quite helpful after. Yeah. I think, I think they need to realize how important it is. It's not just this hobby that you do at some point, it becomes part of who you are and and you, you need to do it. Yeah. You, you really want it so badly. It's just part of you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So what's changed? Do you still have back pain? Kind of back into Um, your most recent story. How about? (laughs) Yeah. So no. Um. It's kind of it's kind of been a long story for our work together because Mm -hmm. we started working together and I didn't really get to do much before the pandemic hit and we had two years of not being able to really do much. Um. And certainly we couldn't cross as Canadians couldn't I couldn't head down to Vermont even in that sort of second year, um. Even when swimming started back up, so I was really you know playing with different ideas and we were working on things in the pool and stuff, but um, I hadn't really had a chance to fully test what we'd learned until I guess 2022, I suppose. So at that point I had signed up to do the search, which is the full crossing of Memphis Magog. That's a 40 kilometer, 25 mile, I think. And um, I had mapped out several swims leading up to it as a way to train. So I had a 
I think I went down for one of the clubhouse swims, uh, which I think we did about 14 kilometers. And then I was going to do the, the border buster and then maybe Massa Whippy as well. And then I was going to do the surge. And at very least, I, I didn't get that far because of an accident. But um, for those first couple of swims, when I was in the water, I had zero pain whatsoever. I was still working on some of my 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 arm recovery and my momentum and different positions that I had to get into. But um, I no longer swum like a banana, I think was the term, very arched back. I had a much better stability in the water and rotation. And I came out of those swims and I don't even think I did any painkillers whatsoever. Like it was really, really great. So that's, again, bolstered that confidence that you need to put the work into your body position if you're having issues. Or even if if you're not, you don't want to get issues down the road, putting that time in is so worth it. So yeah, I popped out of those swims and I, you know, had no pain whatsoever. And walked away from those feeling pretty great so yeah it was kind of like proof that it worked and yeah it was, yeah. It was a really good feeling yeah you said um to put put the work in can you clarify what the work is though for me it was slowing down and i still like doing distance swims as part of my training but i i'm not a mileage whore i don't i don't really care what the total kilometer mileage is in a given month i'm, I'm just training towards something so for i think for us it was really about I've got to slow down. I've got to work on some specific things every single swim. And I'm just going to work on that one thing. And I'm going to test that one thing and take some video of that one thing and see how that one thing feels. And so like that takes a lot of work. I mean, I think people want sort of that instant gratification of the, you know, 10 steps to a better freestyle. But real true change takes a lot of time. I mean, it really started and worked really well over the course of two years. I'm still learning things. I don't think there's ever going to be a point where my technique is perfect and I think putting in the time is really sort of stepping back and going, okay, I'm willing to give up some distance. I'm willing to give up pounding out the miles. I need to see what I have to dial back and sort of focus on. And so that's, that's a lot of my workouts. A lot of our swims that we planned were going to the pool with different things to work on, but not worrying about the time and not really worrying about the total distance. It was really about focus and focusing on certain things. And that takes a lot. I was thinking about how, hard it was for you to get to the water because we were working together through the pandemic and you're like, okay, well, I think I could schedule <laughs> 20 minutes here and half hour there. And I might be able to get back to back slots at this other pool if I drive for an hour. So I just was wanted to understand a little bit about access to water for the focus training that you were doing. Oh, well, I mean, at that time it was really hard because getting any pool, um, getting access to any pool was difficult. And it was very limited. And yeah, so I, you know, tried to take it to open water, which is a little harder because you can't get video in the same way. And it's not not quite as controlled in the same way. And again, I'm I'm pretty lucky to have a tether pool in the garage, but that's, you know, it's not quite the same. It's something. Um, but yeah, access, ac- restricted access was really hard for a lot of people, I think. And when you're trying to work on things, you really, you really start to value the time that you do have and bringing as much focus and attention to what you're doing while you're there because you don't have a lot of it. And, and we didn't really know how long that was going to go on for. So yeah, every single swim was precious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes you want to make it count. And if you're able to make the transition from making it count means getting in some amount X of yards versus making it count means making each stroke informative to your body and understanding your body in the water, like it's a great shift. So then... Uh, the other thing too, when you have lack at lack of access to pool, and this is, I think it's kind of like why I started marathon swim stories in the first place is because there's this big, huge mindset piece to marathon swimming, right? <laughs> so that's why I was like, marathon swimmers are like primed for a pandemic. <laughs> we, we work on our mindset all the time, but we're like carrying it over to life, whatever. There's all kinds of things there too. But tell us how you kind of some of the work you've done around your mindset. Sure. Well, I think it's probably important. Um, to go back a few years and know that I actually signed up for the search years ago. I signed up, I think in 2018, I think I jumped out of massive whippy and I was like, yep, let's go. Let's do 40. Anyway, that's just, that's who I am. And then I realized that I wasn't ready yet. So I deferred by a year and then we had the two years of the pandemic. And then, then I started to really, I mean, I think the pandemic for many people was life-changing. So I came out of that really needing really needing this and really wanting to do really well and really wanting it to be an adventure. And I really wanted to finish, but I wanted it to be more than that. So it was going to be sort of this opportunity for me to grow a lot. So 
I did, I think what most swimmers do is you start to check off the things you need to get ready for, um, for a longer swim. You know, what's my technique look like? What's my feed plan look like? Um, have I done some cold training? Um, uh, what about dark? You know, what about, um, you know, those sorts of things or the, the givens that you have to prepare for. Um, and then I realized that like, there's this whole other <laughs> piece of me that when I think back to the DNF on massive whippy, like there's this whole other piece of me that holds me back from doing things. So I started working on different aspects of my mindset. I picked up a really good book called The Brave Athlete, and it's got different sort of exercises to work yourself through. But what it really came down to is I didn't have self-confidence to know for myself that I could do it. And I had to start working through that. And I and I think I spent just as much time, if not more, working on that and thinking about that than I did on the actual training, like the other stuff. So in, in 2022, what I did is I, you know, one of the best exercises I did was I created a list of every single fear that I had. And I took that list and, and there were some really good ones, but they were kind of the things you'd expect. You know, I'm worried about the cold. I'm worried about the distance. I'm worried I won't have enough energy. You know, it was all about sort of the physical aspects of the swim, but it was still really important because I made a list of absolutely everything. And then uh, in the next sort of column of this list, I said, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? And then I forced myself to walk through, okay, if it's really cold, I might have to pull myself or my crew might have to pull me. And I guess I'll have to sign up and go back again another year. Well, that's actually not that bad. Okay. And then what I did after that is I said, okay, you know, you know what you're worried about, you know, the worst that's going to happen. You've sort of looked at that and accepted it. What are you going to do to train it? And so I would come up with anything I could think of train each fear and so that really started to build my self-confidence but you know that's kind of stuff and it was really important it was really really important it was it was the catalyst for a lot more though so to me that was sort of like fears related to the swim but um i at that point um in the summer <laughs> i had i think i've referred to it now as the epic fall of 2022 I um, had a trip and fall in my kitchen and landed in the corner of our kitchen island and I kind of ping ponged off of it. Um, and I thought, wow, that's really going to hurt later. And I just went about my day. I went swimming. I did one more long training. I started driving to the U.S. for another big uh, training swim leading into the surge. And I got into the U.S. and I turned around and I went back to the emergency room. And what had happened is that the impact to my side had actually popped a rib off of my sternum. Um, one, possibly two. Wow. And so it felt like my, my rib cage had collapsed onto my chest. And um, once we realized this is what happened, um, you know, I said, well, what's the likelihood that I can get back in the water in a couple of weeks? And the ER doctor was like, no, no, your season's done. You need to just go home. You need to just cancel your events. You'll go show them what's what in the U.S. next year. And I was like, oh, OK. But what it did, it, and it was really hard for a long time because, you know, now you realize this thing you've been working towards is completely gone. All that work that you've done, it wasn't really gone, but I wasn't going to be able to prove myself. I wasn't be able to go down and, and do anything. And it was also really hard not to get uh, really down about the situation. I was um, completely immobile, well, pretty immobile for about two weeks. It took about two months to heal. Then I started to get a bit more positive about trying to get back into the water. And I ended up going through a lot of really intense pain, even a couple months later, um, back in the ER, uh, because we were sure that something was seriously wrong, only to find out that I had um, allodynia, which is where you have sort of pain responses to something that normally wouldn't cause pain. So it hurt to put a shirt on. It would hurt my skin. Um, and then more seriously, I had I was diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome. So that is where you have pain and inflammation, even though you were properly healed. So I did a full CT scan in the ER and they said, no, no, you're, everything's back where it should be. Your ribs are perfect, um, but you are clearly in a lot of distress. And I think what it was, was my mind was sending bad signals to my body. There was a lot of fear coming out of that. I was scared to get back in the water. Um, so I had to start from a place to get ready for 2023 to try to redo all of this work, to go back and do these swims, to go back and try to do the 40 kilometer swim. I had to start from a place where I was actually just walking in the water. I couldn't even swim for a long time. And um, and I was really down about it. And I didn't know if I was still going to be a swimmer and all that kind of stuff. So I had to go from there back to relearning the physical stuff. And it was it was great to have Swim Mastery to go back to because we just, again, learn all the positions over again. I eventually started swimming more. But then I had to come back to all that mindset stuff. 
So, and I had a lot of time to think while I was injured. I mean, you have nothing else to do except sit and write and research things and look at stuff. And I think I came back to my fear list. But at that point, I think, you know, time had passed and I actually started working on things. I don't even think I realized I was doing this until after the search was over. But I started digging a lot deeper into, you know, things about myself that I was really struggling with as a person. I started to do an inventory of things that weren't about the swim. It wasn't about whether it was going to be cold or too far. I started looking at, you know, um, how it felt as a kid to have to leave swimming. And that really sucked and how that made me feel and how I, I hated when I failed at that one thing or, you know, relationships that weren't going well or my body image about myself, everything that was hard and that hurt. I brought it all out and I just just threw it on the table. And you might kind of say, well, how is that really swim training? But um, not being able to deal with some of these things as a person, for me anyway, this is what opens up the fear. And this is what leads to self-doubt. And this is what actually just, that's what talks me out of doing amazing things. So you know, swim stuff is all really important. But I think for a lot of swimmers, you have to really take a deeper look and say, like, what's stopping you from doing stuff? And there really isn't anything, but there's all kinds of stuff. And for me, it was just coming up with this sort of inventory. And I would do it piece by piece without even realizing I was doing it, throwing it out there, looking at it, really looking at it, accepting that that stuff had happened, but it's over and I'm here now and we're about to go do these amazing things and just sort of being able to let go of stuff. And I'm still working on a lot of things, but like for some of us, especially if you come from a place of low confidence, being able to get to the point where you're strengthening your mindset, it's not just about the swimming stuff. It's about like what's happening with you. So I think for me, by the time I got to 2023 and I was getting ready to try everything again, go through that series of longer swims leading up to the search, one, one thing that was really, really important for me was that I carried myself across that finish line. And I wasn't swimming to prove to anybody else that I was capable of doing it at that point. You know, I'd, I'd let go of all of that kind of needing to prove myself. And I really wanted to be, it, it had to be for me, first and foremost. I had to own it completely. So um, I kept working on these things and I kept, and then as we got closer and closer to the longer swims, I realized I was less and less nervous. And I was just like, we're here. We're going to have a big adventure. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I was completely okay with not finishing. I mean, that's the first time in my life I could honestly say that. I was okay if I didn't finish because this was going to be something amazing we were going to go do. And I think it's it was amazing to have a crew that cared and moved you forward across the lake. And it was so great to know that my husband, my family, we had friends, we had a WhatsApp chat going so that they could, you know, the crew could let people know what we were doing. It was amazing to have all of these people care and help you, but ultimately I didn't want, I didn't want my crew to have to drag me to the finish. I really needed it to come from me. And I could see on the swim, like, um, that it was there, you know, it was there before I stepped into the water. So like, that's, it was just an incredible journey. It was really fun being a part of that WhatsApp group. <laughs> um, usually I'm on the other side of the water. <laughs> it was fun to be able to be on the that side. Um, tell us what it was like in the water. So you had done all this, the inner child work, I think it's called that, which is so, so, so important. Cause like you said that the, those kind of fears and things that come from the, just the little, they seem insignificant things that happen that you stuff them down and you keep moving on. But if we don't kind of address that and tell ourselves it's okay, we're human. <laughs> That's right. And, yeah. You know, then, then it does, it can consume you in the middle of Totally. you're trying to do something big but um so that wasn't the issue going in i love that you kind of went into the swim feeling completely okay about not finishing i think that's that's amazing yeah it's amazing absolutely amazing and not only that but i think phil phil you know when we were getting ready um we had our our meeting a couple nights before and he said do you want to publish your tracker publicly and i was like yep Absolutely. Publish it. Let people see, like let people follow, let people be part of the journey because it's really important to me to share that with people. And, you know, doing that was me like willingly saying it's OK if I fail publicly. And that was part of one of those letting go exercises was, you know, being totally OK with the idea that you're putting yourself out there and it's about the adventure. I want to finish. But if I don't, I'll be OK. And I'll just go back again. And I'll try again. I'll learn things. And the learning across the swim was more important to me, I think, than even the finish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And will you tell us, you did so many amazing blog posts leading up to that swim and you do so much amazingly informative 
it just the sharing that you do. Will you tell us about your your blog site so that we can all go sure. there? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a work in progress. Um, but wildbigswim.com, I started that. I moved away um, from where I was. I'd been living in Ottawa, Ontario for many years. Um, and I moved back home to the Maritimes. And I wanted a way to kind of connect with my friends back home, I guess, back in my older home from my new home. Um, but I also realized that, you know, there's probably a lot of people like me out there who don't know how to do these things. And the more I learned, the more I would sort of create posts and put things out there. And it just sort of evolved into sort of a blog about myself and my swimming and then trying to put together practical things. Because if somebody else is like me and is starting from, you know, two kilometers and then, you know, gets in with the Vermont crowd, you're going to be doing something longer at some point. So, <laughs> you know, there's lots of people out there who don't know they can and don't know where to start and and just think that they have to do it on their own. And that's that's not really true. So as much as I can put together information for others, that's been what I've wanted to do. Yeah. And some of it I've put out there, I've been pretty raw and honest about, you know, the things I've been working on. I mean, not all of it, but I'm I'm going to be working on it over the next six months or so and trying to put more out of, of how I got to the place where when I walked on shore to start the, the search, I was just completely calm and joyful for the swim. And that's a hard, that's a really hard place to get to. Yeah, for me, it was. Yeah, right. Well, it was, it was, it's been, <laughs> So how many year journey? So you it was yeah. four years prior or something that you had yeah. signed up for it. About time. Yeah. 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 But if you had done it any of those or attempted it any of those other years, I don't think you would have had the same outcome. I don't think so. I mean, I think in 2022, I was very ready. Like yeah, you I were. wanted, I was ready. Um, and the accident kind of messed with my head, but it also made me realize how strong your mind body connection is. I mean, I'd never even heard of these things that I was dealing with, especially yeah. the complex regional pain stuff. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It was so real for so many. I still have issues if um, mm. I have a fear response or I actually kind of aggravated the injury a little bit heading into the search and had just swelling all down my side, but I was not going to not swim. So I just had to figure it out. But um, it made me appreciate how strongly connected your mind is to your body and and the messages it can send, whether you're talking about the confidence stuff or the pain stuff or, yeah, it can totally control and take over. So um, that's why that work was so important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Take us a little bit into the swim. Oh, well, it was amazing. It was just amazing. I trained for absolutely every nightmare situation. I was out in cold water wind you know, just miserable weather. I'd go do all of this stuff. And then the night of the swim, I had to take a screenshot because I didn't think anybody would believe me, but the weather was zero kilometers per hour. It was perfectly pancake flat. Um, we had a three quarter moon. There were loons out singing. It was just, you know, I, I don't know. It was just absolutely magical. And the night swimming part was the funnest for me because I'd done the training for it, but I've never swum that long in the dark. And because we had some moonlight, I could see the mist and the mountains and the crew and the boat. And it was just surreal. It was just absolutely wonderful. But because I was um, lathered in zinc oxide and white and glowy in the moonlight, I attracted animals. <laughs> so um, I had my first experience with critters, uh, which I've never had to experience before. I looked over at one point and there was this dark shadow in the water. And, you know, as a kid raised on horror movies in the 80s, that's not good. Um, and then I realized it was a loon that was, you know, a loon's bum that was kind of going oh under. And it's okay, already we're good. But I didn't pause and stop it and freak out. And then um, then the fish um, started um, coming to hang out with me. And I was bumped to one side, bumped to another side. Oh, wow. And then at one point, a fish actually uh, wrapped its lips around my toe and sucked on my big toe for like a <laughs> And I was like, what else? Like, I mean, you know, what? Like, okay, what next? But it made me realize that, you know, every adverse thing that happened because of all the mindset stuff I'd done, it was just like a joke. It was a laugh. It was funny. It was like, I guess there's really big fish in this lake. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, nothing actually bothered me, even though all of it was kind of scary a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But I just kept going and I didn't break my stride at all. The only really kind of experience maybe I could have lived without was uh, swimming through an algae bloom. Mm, um, yeah. So that was the only time I kind of stopped and shrieked because... I swam into this big, disgusting mass of jelly and it had like, it had like strands of like seaweed, like weeds in it and stuff. And I was just like, oh, it was really gross. But I figured out what to do to get out of it without ingesting anything. And I just kept going. So I was like, look, at, look at everything we're learning. Look at all yeah, of yeah. this stuff. We're learning. Yeah, look, we're learning a lot. 
Um, and then, um, I mean, when we hit the Canadian border, I was just like overjoyed, you know, and I, I knew how many feeds in we were and I knew we were doing pretty well. So that was really exciting. But I said, you know, I'm going to slow myself down a little bit because I don't know how much energy I need to keep. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was really proud that all the kind of self decisions I had to make along the way about my body were right, you know, and I was right to kind of slow down a bit. I I wasn't trying to go fast, but I just worried that I might run out of steam. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there were different parts along the lake where the crew kind of pointed out different things for me. And it was just really exciting to see I'd never swum past much past the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. So as the sun came up and I got to see Owl's Head Mountain and just all of these wonderful things, it was like, yeah, it's just really awesome. I did um, still have a lot of issues with my feeds on the swim. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, I'm working with a new product that I absolutely love. Um, and I think I've got things figured out. But, you know, your body is not really meant to digest horizontally. I mean, not unless you're on the sofa watching Netflix, but, you know, forward <laughs> swimming for hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, you're not really meant to be digesting that way. And you don't really start eating. I mean, I don't eat at one o'clock in the morning all the way into daylight. So, By about three and a half hours in, my stomach was already like, no, I think we're good. Don't give me anything else. But Mm -hmm. we were only three and a half hours in. So we really had to sort of figure out how to, I went from taking 15 second feeds to a couple minutes, but I was like, look, there's no wind. We're not being pulled around. Just relax. And I'll I'll take as long as I need to get the feed down. And uh, at a point they kind of had to sort of tell me to keep drinking a bit more because I was Mm -hmm. having a hard time, but I had energy through the roof. Like it was fantastic. So I think the feeds are something I still have to work on. And then what we did for the last third of the swim, I knew that that's where I was going to start to, you know, falter a bit. I was going to get tired. That's where I'd never been before. I'd been to 25 kilometers. I knew where that was on the lake. When we got there, I was like, this is my longest swim ever. And then the rest of it had to sort of figure it out. Um, and so we had different sort of, I guess, games or motivational things that the crew would get me to do to keep my mind busy and keep me going. But what was really hard for me was the heat. Mm. I chose September because I wanted a chillier swim, you know, being a cold water swimmer. Um, I was super excited about September. The first week is going to be wonderful. It's going to be fall. And we had a heat wave. Um, <laughs> and so it was really, really hard for me. I don't do well with heat at all. And so I allowed myself to slow down even more in that last third on purpose, because I knew if I and I had energy to spare, I could have really pushed into that finish. But I knew that that would get my internal heater going. And then I have had the experience before where I've come out of a swim, underhydrated, overheated, and ended up in the ER for uh, fluids. So I was really scared that that was going to happen. So I kind of dialed it back. And, you know, it got to the point where I felt like my eyeballs were warm in my goggles. And it was just Mm. awful. It was just as awful. I think it got up to, um, I think, 82 Fahrenheit, which is like about 28, which for me is awful. It's just awful. Yeah. But, you know, I made it through and um, I just I just made sure that my stroke rate was low and calm and Mm -hmm. I was relaxed because I knew if I wasn't, we're probably going to be in trouble. I'd end up getting pulled from the swim, but not because I wasn't capable, but because of the heat. So that was really so there's some things learned on the swim Um, Mm -hmm. as much as I prepared for it. You know, we came out sort of talking about stuff and there were things I could do differently next time. But overall, I just thrilled when we got to the other side. I was so excited. Yeah, I was too. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> it was it was just awesome to land in Canada. Like, you know, as someone I work in immigration and for me, borders are interesting and, and being able to cross one on the water like that is really cool. And to land in your own country, like it's just yeah, it was it was really special. Yeah, very cool. Anything else you want to share with your story? I think, you know, I think the most important thing for me out of this is you know, a lot of work went into it. Um, but if I'm capable, anybody else really is. And I, I think people really have to look at where that comes from. And for me, it was, I really had to come from me that I was going to carry myself across the finish and be strong enough and efficient enough in the water, but also strong enough in my mindset that I could carry myself forward and, and still be able to, you know, come out of it. Um, knowing that I, yeah, I wanted to come out of it knowing that I was capable. And I think if I can do that, just about anybody can, like, it's, it's not some mystery. It's not reserved for special people. You know, you can put the effort in the time and, and, and start looking at what you need to do. And it, it's, it's doable, you know? So yeah, I think that's the big message for me is I came out of it super happy, but it just was confirmation that all the things that I'd worked on were the right things for me anyway, the things I needed to do. So you have to kind of trust yourself at a point. Um, and, and learn from others and observe from others and, and take it all in, but you have to kind of sit down and say, well, what do I actually need? And 
who am I, you know, and what's going to help me get across the water. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the big message for me anyway. Trust yourself. That's a big one. Yep. Absolutely. Do you think you're going to keep swimming? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, in the spirit of biting off way more than you can chew. I mean, that's just my personality and I'm never not going to be that way. Um, my, my poor husband apparently was talking to his parents um, shortly after my swim. And he said, you know, I got to get her out of Vermont. I got to get her out of Vermont before they convince her to do a double. I got to get her out of there. <laughs> He's joking about it. And I'm like, well, you know, that's not the craziest idea. I mean, whether it's a double of that lake or just something longer somewhere, I mean, who's to say, who's to say I couldn't do that? No one, no one's to say I can't do that. And I really did come out of this one feeling like I still had more. It's not my ceiling. Um, 40 kilometers was not my ceiling. Um, I don't know what is, but if I go into it with that same mindset of it's an adventure and, you know, I don't need things that are just guaranteed for me anymore. I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see where I go. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Nadine. Thanks for having me, Shannon. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you were inspired by even just a moment of this story, please share it with a friend. You never know what might push someone out of their comfort zone so that they can find out what they're capable of. And please leave a review with your podcast provider. It truly helps others discover the raw and honest stories of these amazing endurance swimmers. Thanks for listening.